Major Pat Irvine with the Salvation Army. Um, I failed really to get much of the background, her background, but I do know that we do a lot through the year with our auction and our bell ringing to help the Salvation Army. So I'm hoping Pat will will uh, share with us uh, many of the programs that those efforts support. That's great. So. Well, it's wonderful to be with such a distinguished club. I am basking in your glory, so thank you for allowing me to come and be a part. Can I clip it? Well, I'm Italian. Not really. But when I speak, my hands go everywhere. So if I bump it, I apologize. I'm a music educator by, by former profession, so I tend to still do this. Well, thank you for inviting me. I thought I would uh, try to figure out what you want to know about the Salvation Army. There is much that I can tell you, so I'm going to try to cover uh, some perhaps might be important topics for you that might uh, match your interest or answer some questions. And then if I missed anything, which I'm sure I will, please ask at the end. Uh, my husband, Major Jim Irvin, sends his greetings. My Tootsie Wootsie. I've got to ask him if he knows what that means when I get back to the office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he is actually involved in a, a need study that the Salvation Army of Lafayette has just initiated. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So as usual, we divide and conquer. Well, we try to conquer. And I, first of all, I just want to say I love your spirit. We share a spirit, and that is to serve and not to be served. Whoever prayed the invocation, thank you. It was just, it was perfect, because we definitely share that in common. If there's anything that's important to the Salvation Army, it is to serve people. It is to serve people. The Salvation Army was founded in 1865 in Victoria, London, England, by a Methodist itinerant preacher by the name of William Booth. Uh, he was married, and uh, by the time the uh, Salvation Army was in its early, early years, he was married to a very, I have to add this, a very brilliant woman, and she really was. Her name was Catherine Booth, and they had quite the brood. They had eight children. And Catherine, by the age of 12, had read uh, the Bible eight times through and was very brilliant. Uh, she actually was confined to her bed. She was ill for most of her life. And through that, that allowed her the opportunity to read. And she was very, very well read. And so I like to think, and I still think, they made a great ministry team. And so I try to think that my husband and I try to bounce off each other and balance one another out. And I think we, we do okay. We do all right. We enjoy working together. And that's not always easy, but we enjoy it very much. Well, the Salvation Army moved from London, England, and uh, over to the United States in 1888, actually by one man and eight women. Try to imagine that. And they came over to this country, and the Salvation Army was founded. And today, we're in almost every country in the world. Well, the Salvation Army it has great name recognition. It's kind of like Pepsi-Cola. What does the Salvation Army do? Well, they help people. Well, how do they help people? Well, I'm not sure. I know they ring the bell at Christmas time, which is true. Isn't that red kettle a wonderful thing? That was actually started by a captain in San Francisco uh, just after the Salvation Army was founded, probably about 10 years after we came to this country. He had a need, and that's what the Kiwanis is good at, and that's what we try to be good at, is sensing needs. And rather than caring from afar, we get our hands dirty, and we get right in there and go to action. And so Captain McPhee decided he wanted to take advantage of all the ships that came into port and, and people were coming and going. That's a very busy place. And so he decided, I'm going to sit a black pot down at the end of the pier and see if I stand there, uh, see if I can get any collections for the poor. 
And sure enough, it was the ugliest black pot you've ever seen, I'm sure. But it didn't matter. And after he started, somewhere along the line, somebody thought, well, let's paint it red. Red is a more noticeable color. And so it's still here. And that amazes me. Christmas just doesn't seem to be Christmas without that belt. Because the money that we uh, earn at Christmas, that we raise at Christmas, funds to help the poor. Roughly 80% of every dollar goes out the door. So you can imagine, uh, we have a very <coughs> small staff, and they deserve to be paid more than they are, but we work as a team, and we want to serve, just like this marvelous club. And thank you for ringing the bell for the auction and for other things that I'm probably not aware of that your club does. Uh, it's marvelous. So what does the Salvation Army Lafayette do? Well, we've been in Tippecanoe County since the late 1800s. We were located down on 4th Street. And fast forward to 2010, when we showed up uh, at the door, July 1st, 2010, the Salvation Army was lo is located on Union Street in its current facility. We have social service offices, we have a sanctuary because foremost we are a church and in the united states not too many people realize that we are a church and our mission after all is to preach the gospel of jesus christ and meet human need in his name without discrimination and that's what we stand by every single day we love to serve people and so when we came in 2010 we discovered we have an emergency family shelter that at one time was a men-only shelter. Well, at some point along the way, there was a realization of a need. So what did we do? Well, you would probably think the same thing. We've got to do something about it. And so the men's shelter was transformed into a family <coughs> shelter. You know, the homeless need is increasing. Children are going hungry. Moms and dads are unemployed and feeling hopeless. I don't know about you if you've ever been in that situation where your child was hurting for a reason, a good reason, and they usually always are if they're hurting, emotionally hurting or sad, you want to do something about it. That's what parents do. And parents want to do something, but they are unable to. And we want to help them take care of their children. And so the money that you raise provides the food that the children eat. It provides the food the parents take home so that they are cooking meals for their family. They are able to take care of their children. The money that you provide provides school supplies. Uh, we provided over 1,100 school supplies to school children who were not going to have school supplies for school in the Lafayette School Corporation and surrounding school corporations. So we thank you very much for your partnership. We're looking at the current need. What is most important? What is the greatest need in Tippecanoe County? Many needs are not seen. People hurt and we don't know it all the time. And so we are initiating a need study and a company is helping us to determine, and we're asking a lot of individuals in the community, what is the, the most important need, do you think? And how can the Salvation Army best address that need? Now, I will have to say that what's very important in a very strained economy is, is the, important, uh, the importance of partnering and collaborating. That's more of an agency term. I like the term partnering. Hand in hand, arm in arm. We can work together as we have in the past. Uh, the Kiwanis Club and the Salvation Army uh, here, we can make a difference together. And the partnering is so important. It's, it's, it really is true that one man can't do the job alone. Some really smart guy wrote that once. I think his name was Solomon. And he said, it takes two. Because if one falls down, who's going to pick him up? And I hope that if I ever fall, 
that I will have someone that will care, not from a distance, but will stretch out that hand and pick me up. Because you know what? At some point or another in life, we fall. We do. And we want to work together so that our neighbors, our friends, family members, perhaps our own children, co-workers can rise again. People we don't even know we may never meet will know that it's not about caring from a distance, but it's about lending out a hand to help. And so our need study will, uh, we've initiated it now, it will move forward for the next few months, and it will help us answer that question. What can the Salvation Army help with? What can we uniquely provide? It may be emergency shelter for families. It's very important to us in a day and age when families are literally crumbling that we restore families. And families come into our shelter and they are as broken as you can imagine. And our team in the shelter, we've got the best shelter staff anywhere. Uh, and they lend a hand. They cry when there's crying. They rejoice when there's rejoicing. When there's birthday parties for 16 year olds, they celebrate and decorate because people matter. And so they serve our families and our families are able to get back on their feet. And what I really appreciate is that once families exit, typical stay is about 40 to 60 days, we follow up. We make personal phone calls and sometimes visits. We'll call, how are you doing? Is everything okay? Are you making it? Are you happy? Do you still have hope? And if the answer is no, we do everything we can. We find partners in the community that can help us provide the needs where there are unmet needs. And so the Salvation Army, we do what we do because of you. That's the truth. We could not possibly do it alone. And when we receive money, uh, sometimes when it's a check, it doesn't matter what the amount is, we write a personal thank you card because it does mean everything, everything to us because it means there's a child that will be able to eat. There's a family that's one step closer to having their own home and to caring for their family. And that means the world to us. And I know it does to you as well. I know that. So thank you very much uh, for what you do. Now just a little bit about, I didn't want to talk about myself really very much, but just a quick uh, bio. Uh, my husband and I have been married for 36 years and we have three sons. <coughs> Our oldest is married and works for the Salvation Army in Chicago. And uh, he's, he's what you would think of as the youth pastor for the city of Chicago for the Salvation Army. You wouldn't believe how many teenagers and young adults are in Chicago, but there are hundreds of them. And he is good at what he does. He's married to a doctor of optometry, and she's busy with her work, and they're a marvelous team, a husband and wife. They've been married five years. And then our two sons that are here with us, Jeremy is a graduate of Purdue University, a very proud graduate. We display our Purdue flag at our home, and he is a criminal justice major and is in the final application process for entering the State Police Academy in Pennsylvania. And I think his Purdue degree had a little bit to do with that, so we are very proud. And then our youngest son is a sophomore at Moody Bible Institute. He is distance learning. He likes his mom and dad, go figure. And so he wanted to stay home uh, for a little bit longer and hang out in Lafayette. And he will be moving on campus in the fall uh, there in Chicago. And his plan is to uh, take love for people overseas. And uh, so we will have to probably get used to, if we ever will, loving him from a distance, from far away. So that's kind of our our little brood that we have at home. We've been officers for 21 years. This is a second career. My husband was telecommunications specialist for a new product, and it was called email. 
<laughs> and I was uh, a music educator in a middle school. We spent some years in Canada. My husband is Canadian, and I still love him, so that's okay. And uh, we lived there for some years, and our two oldest children were born there. And then we came to the United States to enter the Salvation Army Seminary in 1990. And so we've been officers ever since. We're both uh, children of Salvation Army officers. It doesn't always happen that way, but we are very proud. Um, my parents are my heroes, and they served the Army well all those years, and they live in Omaha, Nebraska. I have two siblings that are Salvation Army officers. One sister is in Kansas City, Missouri, and the other one just north of us in Crystal Lake, Illinois, where it's extremely cold, <laughs> probably colder than it is here. Are there any questions I could answer? I'm glad you told us your bio because I was wondering how how you know, how did this all work? Yeah, yeah. Salvation Army officers. I could mention that uh, we move around like the military, and so we receive a phone call saying you are being farewelled, so you're leaving. You know what farewell means? Bye, <laughs> see ya. And you are being appointed to, and then you find out where you're going. So you cannot pre-select where you'd like to live. You go where the need is, and the Army sends you. So it's, I have to say, it's a very adventurous life. There is really no dull moment. Uh, the changing has challenges in the moving. When you have a family, uh, it takes a lot of grace. Uh, that does not come from, when, from ourselves alone. So. Uh, a lot from God to see us through, and he has been extremely faithful. So that's how the move thing works. We have not received a phone call. Um, perhaps our staff would want us to receive a phone call, but I hope not. But uh, we are loving it here. We are enjoying it. We're very happy. We're very busy. And uh, only God knows what tomorrow brings for us. Yes? I, I did not realize the Salvation Army is a church. Right. And that you have a chapel? We do. Can you talk about that a little more? Well, I can. We have a, we have a lovely building. And if you're facing it um, off Union Street, so if you're at the end of the parking lot by the flagpole, the sanctuary is on this end. And then the shelter is on the opposite end. And our sanctuary, uh, probably, if we max out on Sunday, would probably would hit 60 would be a little uncomfortable and you, you know if you if you're a church attender you don't necessarily sit shoulder to shoulder so you need a little bit of a kind of private worship space and that's a good thing so we wish we had a bigger chapel uh, but we have a great uh, congregation uh, it's come as you are and in fact William and Catherine Wood <coughs> found that they wanted to tell people about God and about hope but they weren't able to do so because they were hungry. And it was people that, that the church at the time wouldn't allow to come to church because they didn't have the right clothing. They were dirty. They were smelly. And so they took care of their physical needs and their hurts. And then eventually uh, they, their idea was to put them back in the church. But they ended up, it just happened, they ended up starting and beginning the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army was out on the street, out on the street with the people, uh, you know, meeting those needs firsthand. So our congregation is a very diverse. We have people uh, with all kinds of needs. And when people ask us, well, is your congregation then all of poor people? I always say yes. We are all poor in spirit. We're all poor in spirit. We all hurt. And hurt defies any economic status. We're all human. And so we open our doors to the whosoever. And uh, we, have, we have a shelter family with a single mom and son who at one time was in our shelter. A year, over a year has gone by, I think. And she's doing just fine. She's doing great. Yes? The importance of a name, I think, indicated by your name, Salvation Army. When I think of an army, I think 
of a battle. You're set up in a military uh, system. Uh, from your estimation, with whom would you do battle? With whom do we do battle? Yes. We fight poverty and hopelessness yeah. and despair. And we want to bring hope and restoration. We don't do it in our own physical strength and our own human strength. Yeah. Second so. question, does Audrey ever preach? <laughs> she does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I should have her come preach here. Is that fair? <laughs> we need a couple hours in. <laughs> yeah, all three of us take our turn. Um, Audrey does preach. Sometimes we're there. Sometimes we have to be away. And uh, she's, she's very, very uh, ready to, to help and, and take a take a turn at the pulpit, so to speak. But it's a wonderful, it's not too often that women are able to be ordained. I'm as ordained as my husband. We went through the same seminary program. And uh, when we entered the training program, we were already married and had two of our three children. And so there are facilities and apartments on campus where you live, and they take marvelous care of your children, marvelous. And so we were able to go through the same program uh, I have equal ordination, and uh, we have the same rank because we've been in the same amount of years of service we've given to the Army. So, yes? The image of the Salvation Army has always been uh, a, a small band of musicians on the street. How do you, how do you, how do you uh, relate to that? How do I relate to that? Well, I, I'm one of those musicians. I'm not on the street the way I probably should be. Uh, we, we've been out, we, we did a better job historically of being out with the people. And somewhere along the way, and I'm speaking in general, the Salvation Army stayed inside more than going out. And, and it was unintentional. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a small staff, and so it requires a lot. We, we pitch in and we uh, get everything done. Well, as the world becomes more complicated, so does the paperwork. Yeah. It's the way it is. And there is a lot. We have to report on everything we do, and that is not an exaggeration. So we want to do our best to provide statistics and figures and information. Information is important. People want to know. If they want to know, how can I give? Where is my money going? They deserve an accurate, honest answer, and we want to be able to do that. And so I think we ended up staying more inside. But we still have, uh, the Salvation Army in general is still, there's, music is, is still an important part of ministry to people. Uh, we're not out on the corner the way we used to be, and I hope that that will change one day. Uh, I think overseas we're out with the people more than we are here. It's a different culture. Any other questions? Yes. I have two questions. Jerry. Okay. Uh, I know that your uh, cattle campaign was uh, quite a bit short of yes. the goal as of Christmas. Was that deficit ever made up? And secondly, what is the typical length of an assignment before your transfer? Okay. Well, typical length, I'll answer that one first. The typical length of an assignment depends. <laughs> Uh, for us, we average probably three and a half years mm -hmm. to four years, which seems very short. Yeah, yeah. Rarely does a high school student get through high school in the same high school. Now, the Salvation Army is trying to address that. There's just so much need. And when an officer dies or is ill for some length of time, Sometimes it requires, or retires, yay, uh, there requires shifting around of personnel. That's the only way to do it. And so it does mean that the Army may say, we'd like to leave you. We know you're in the middle of a big project, but we, we just have to move you. You are the people to go. And so, uh, and so that's kind of how that happens. Christmas. Christmas, we did fall short of our goal by about $70,000. Now, it has not been made up, 
And so my husband and I are in the middle of trying to figure out what does that mean. We do not want to cut services to people. Now, what does that mean? I, I don't know. But we have to provide answers to our headquarters here in the next week. And as we are uh, puzzling, and honestly I will say praying, or most, about this situation, uh, there is this interesting piece that we have. We are not worried. We are not concerned. Somehow it's going to work out. And I'm not trying to simplify it, but that's absolutely the truth, that it will work out. Um, just this morning, we had um, some funds come through the door, and we were able to add that. And so people give all through the year. We have money coming in in envelopes, $10, and we rejoice, $5, $20, $1, and we rejoice because we're not worried. We, want, we know that God is interested when people hurt and somehow it's going to work out and it will. So thank you for asking. Any other questions? Yes? What are the qualifications to be a candidate to be a Salvation Army officer? Well, now that's a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Foremost, there needs to be a calling, a calling to ministry, a calling that is, is witnessed by an individual and I think by others. And it's a calling that uh, requires, it's quite a long process for application. There is a lot of screening, which I think is important. This is not easy. Uh, anyone here that's a retired, any retired pastors or current ministers, okay? So you know, you know, it's, it's very, it's a very difficult, it's a calling and it's a difficult, it brings great joy. But the candidacy requires lots of paperwork. Uh, if you're a husband and wife, <coughs> you must both experience and be able to express an individual unique calling. And I can tell you briefly about ours. We were living in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We were both uh, professionals. We had two young children. We were very involved as lay pastors in our Salvation Army Church, which whose average attendance was about 350 every Sunday. And uh, we were, it was a spring night. I remember it like yesterday. And he and I were sitting outside just enjoying uh, the sunset. And it was very quiet. And it actually became uh, kind of one of those nervous quiets where you're wondering, something's going on here. And we realized at that moment, uh, individually and at the same time, that there was something that was missing. We were doing fine. We had lots of friends. We were very busy in our church. Our God was blessing our ministry, and that was marvelous, and yet there was something missing. And we had to identify what that was. And so that began the process of application. Actually, we were, we were applying to the officers in Canada, and it just did not work out. And so eight months went by, and we had a house full of furniture in a market where homes were not selling, not one. And we knew, though, of our calling. Now, we could have said, nah, houses aren't selling, we'd be foolish. But we said yes, no matter what. And within a week, everything was done. I know what it's like, what it might have been like for Moses to stand at the Red Sea, because that's how we felt. We were blown away. And that was definitely confirmation. It was hard to leave Canada, it was very difficult. Uh, but we had to be obedient. So that's the candidacy program. There is a psychological evaluation, and they still accepted us after that. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> and we've been at it ever since. Any other questions? Yes? You have the family shelter. Do you have other programs that are just kids that are around that are not part of the shelter, but 
still have programs? Yes, we have. We do provide social services to individuals that, that need help with uh, rental assistance, utilities, uh, food, and those kinds of things. And then we have, uh, we have a few youth programs that we're very proud of. Our youth program that meets every Tuesday focuses on character <laughs> building. And uh, we feed the children, which is always a good thing to do. And they are happy, happy campers. Well, most Tuesdays, aren't they, Audrey? Most of the time. <laughs> Audrey is the, the core program director, and so she oversees that program. I get to hang out with the teens, and uh, I have a blast. We, we absolutely love it. So that's our Tuesday night program, and it runs through the school year uh, for students or children from uh, first grade age, say up to graduates in high school. And uh, we have a couple of seniors this year that will be uh, preparing uh, for college next year. So uh, we're going to miss them, uh, seeing them as much as we do now. And then we have, we just started an archery program. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, having the kids involved in that. And that really it provides a lot of discipline and skill. And, you know, if you can hit the, the, the bow in the bullseye, well, good for you. I think that's an important thing to be able to do. And so it, it brings adults and kids together. It provides an opportunity for children who have no mentors in their life to have caring adults that really care and, and work with the kids. And I love that. And then we have a coing club that meets on Thursdays. Um, today's the day after school. And so... They enjoy, all, they learn all kinds of things, practical life skills as they uh, collect their callings, and they learn so much, I'm amazed. And that's run by a retired volunteer, and he's a marvelous gentleman. So we do love to work with young people, and it will be interesting to see what the needs study, uh, what the results are, so that we can see what we need to do about it. Is the accurate word again, was it calling or calling? Calling? Oh, was that what you were saying? I, I wasn't yes. sure. Yes, yes. Okay. Does the archery program run with, with volunteers as well? It's, yes. It's sort of a, a one on one intensive, at least in Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, our volunteers, our adult volunteers, have to be certified and trained, and they receive that training, and, and they do work with the, with the youth. <coughs> So it's a really good opportunity for mentoring and for the, for the kids to develop. In fact, one of the young ladies, is a, she's a Lockett area special services student at Jet High School. And she doesn't talk about anything else. She loves archery because somebody takes the time to, to care about her and, and love her. And so that's a really great thing. She's a happy girl. That's good. Yes. You have a winter coat program too, don't you? Yes, we have coats for kids, and that takes place in November. And uh, we gave, in fact, I have my statistics here. I did bring a community impact sheet, and it's a basic page that will give you some numbers. Some people like to see the numbers of our different events and our services that we provide. Our coat for kids uh, and winter accessories, we were something about the amount of time it takes and the challenge it takes for people to get around. What else? We, uh, we provide overnight camp experience. We have a camp, Salvation Army Camp, that's down in Bedford, Indiana. It's three hours and 15 minutes to drive, and it's absolutely gorgeous country down there. And the children sleep overnight uh, with counselors in their cabins, and the kids can swim, they can learn how to hike in the woods, how to survive, and you know what? They can be in the sun and they can have fun. They can just have fun and be kids. And that's really important. We want kids to be able to remember what it's like to be a kid and do the things that kids do. And that's run around and eat too many chocolate bars sometimes and laugh with their friends and, and be happy for a week. So that's a really great experience.